Hey guys, can you hear us? Good, good morning. morning. Good morning. Testing. Genius. Okay, hi guys. <laughs> good, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the first uh, Sunday live session uh, of the year. Wait, yes. This is, yep. Yes. This 221 has already started off great. We've got some really interesting things going on for the beginning of the year. And uh, uh, the greatest thing that's happened to me is having my one of my best friends and uh, my t teacher and uh, a mentor, um, uh, really uh, one of the one of the great uh, one of the great humans in my life. This guy over here who's now got some hair, <laughs> he's grown some hair on his face. I've always told him that a man without a beard was like a woman with a beard. <laughs> and now he's matured and. He's got a beard and looks so handsome, and uh, he looks serious. Looks, he finally looks, he finally looks, you know, dangerous. <laughs> now that he's got hair. Finally, huh? So, yeah, finally. Um, uh, Rafael Lovato Jr. Um, so for you guys um, who are uh, all with us today, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little bit of of introduction for Rafael, and then I'm gonna let him jump in with. You know, sort of fleshing out his his you know who he is and his accomplishments, um, but in general, um, I'm going to hit a couple so you know you don't have to feel like you're just sitting talking about yourself because that's super fun to do. But um, number one, uh, I had the privilege to uh, be a part of his team as he accomplished something that I think is uh, very special. He won the Bellator middleweight world title, beating a very uh, legendary fighter in the sport, um, Gegard Mousasi. Uh, we did that in London. I say we because I was, I was right in there getting punched in the face too. <laughs> N I was not. Uh, as he was in there for five s fucking rounds of just. Everyone was pretty stressed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we were all pretty stressed. Uh, he won uh, that title. It was it was probably one of the most special moments of my life as well. I'm sure, of course, for you, but for me. Um, he is uh, considered, right now, you just got voted. Is, yeah, can you flush that out? Because something. Uh, With the American greatest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so they, they created like a point system. Okay. And they uh, being flow grappling. Gra excellent. Yeah, flow, gra yeah. flow grappling is a very, it's like one of the leaders in the industry for for um news and media yeah. and coverage and all that stuff yeah um but uh for brazilian yeah, jiu-jitsu they, they, yeah. they created a, a point system and designated a certain amount of points for all of the main events that exist um inside of jiu-jitsu and grappling mm -hmm. and uh and according to you know whether you won or if you won your division and absolute da -da -da, you would get a certain amount of points and um, and they took all the greatest Americans in the game and and added up their points and put them in a ranking. And oh, and look what happened! Yeah, you were number one. I was number one. Yeah, that's it. Above above some of the current uh, guys who people really consider because you know, like in any sport, sometimes if if you've just if you've just come onto the scene of a sport. In the last one year, two years, three years, you might not know what the sport looks like when yeah. you lay out a timeline. Mm -hmm. You've been in this sport for ever, forever. <laughs> yeah, really, for a really no, long time. Uh, no, I've really. been a black belt now. This will be my seventeenth year as a yeah. black belt. So, guys, just to wrap your head, he's been a black belt for seventeen years already. Uh, so he's been studying and practicing martial arts since he was a child. Because I know his father and, and his whole family history, which is a history of martial arts. His father uh, has been a teacher, studied uh, under the Bruce Lee system, Jeet Kune Do, with Dan Asinato and, and Richard Dan, Bastillo. Yeah, and, and, the, uh, and th we won't go too deep into that, but Rafael's been uh, a student of martial arts since a child. Uh, he achieved his br black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu at... I had just turned 21. Right. And uh, 
So now, uh, to, if you can go back in time, you won a world. You won. You won your world title at what? Your first world title at what age? Um, Regardless of black belt or not, just any. Twenty four. Okay. I just turned twenty four. Excellent. And now he's seventy three. So if you can <laughs> do the math on that, this guy's been in the game for a long time. So so okay. So twenty four, and now you are. I'll be thirty eight this year. Right. So if you think about how long that is being like being a competitor and being and competing at the highest level, that's a very long time to be in a, in this mm -hmm. sport. Mm -hmm. So for the people who just came on the scene, they're like, wait a minute, isn't Gordon Ryan number one? Isn't so-and-so? And then yeah. suddenly they, they see Rafael Lovato Jr. And I think it's amazing because they get to, they get to be introduced to somebody they might mm -hmm. not even be familiar yeah. with your span of that definitely happened um after they released the the breakdown mm -hmm. in the little article um yeah. people were expecting i think some of the the bigger names these days to mm -hmm. be at the top and uh and there are i mean the sport has grown dramatically mm -hmm. um especially in the last three four years mm -hmm. and um and the last six years i've been I was more focused on MMA. Um, I didn't really even do any of the jiu-jitsu competitions that, mm -hmm. that would have given me points for that ranking that they did. Mm -hmm. um, my main focus was MMA. And so uh, as the sport has hit its peak, I have not been, uh, you know, it hasn't been my number one focus. Uh, mm -hmm. MMA was my number one focus. And, you know, uh, a lot of those events are for the quote unquote young guys and I'm just not in that scene as much. And so um, when they put that out, it was funny. I actually got a, a lot of new fans mm -hmm. um, uh, or followers or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's good. It's good that, that, that they get to know a little bit more about my history because I came up in a time where jujitsu and mixed martial arts was in its very beginning roots. Um, uh, you know, the, the art of Brazilian jujitsu was just coming over into the U.S. And my dad was a part of one of the first groups um, of American martial artists to become students of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He was the first one to bring it to our area of the country um, in Oklahoma, uh, where I live. And, um, and he was a, uh, a mar martial arts pioneer um, as a whole, but especially in the art of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And he was the first black belt in our state. We became the first father and son American Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belts. Um, and you know, I went to Brazil the first for the first time in 1999 when I was just 16 years old mm -hmm. to to train and compete in the World Championships. Um, and I'm like 99% sure, sure that I'm the first American teenager to have ever traveled to Brazil to do that. You were also one of the first Americans to ever win a world title. Yes, I was number three, mm -hmm. or uh, number two or number three. There's a guy mm -hmm. that's like his. Um, his father's Brazilian, his mother, or something like that. His mother is Brazilian, his father's American, and he kind of goes back and but forth. That's cheating. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're talking. Uh, but he, he grew up training in Brazil. Most of his training was in Brazil. Mm -hmm. um, he was the second. Mm -hmm. so BJ Penn was in 2000. Mm -hmm. The person I'm talking about is Robert Drysdale. Yeah. He was 2005, yeah. and I was two years later in 2007. Yeah. Yeah, I actually met Robert because of you mm -hmm. at, at one, a Bellator event. What, he's a character, uh, he's a fun guy. I uh, just wrote a new, yeah. created that new book. About a lot of the history of Yeah, Brazilian which I highly recommend to, yeah. to you guys if you're interested in the world. It's called uh, Open Guard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I, I talked to him about that book. I have, I have a copy as well. Um, I haven't been able to dive in completely, but uh, he spent a long time on it. Yeah. So, yeah, and I think that's a great contribution to the, yeah. to the sport. Because it, it, around that same time, I started studying. I, I joined my first jiu-jitsu academy with Hickson mm -hmm. in 2003 and and so at, at that time you were already right at <laughs> I think you're already at that point almost a black belt yeah my father got his black belt in 2003 and then I got mine in 2004 right so yeah so and that's weird because I'm still a white belt with you why is that <laughs> something is not changing um so um we so 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 just for you guys you know some context so so in the world of mixed martial arts, UFC, Bellator, and one these 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 um, promotions that you might be familiar with out there, um, a lot of guys transition from the world of 
one combat sport into this mixed com world of combat sports. So you might be a jiu-jitsu champion, you go over there. You might be a wrestling champion, you go over there. You might come from Sambo, whatever. But different, different modalities find their way sort of slowly but surely because why do you think, just, just as a, a side note, why do you think people from these other combat sports sort of tend to find their way? Is this the bigger stage? Oh, 100%. 100% and it's the ultimate challenge you know as a martial artist um, your skills who you are um, how you react in that environment you know it's not going to get you're not going to find a greater challenge than being locked in a cage with another professional martial artist who's spent his whole life you know preparing for that moment as well so um, for me that's really the main thing it wasn't about um, the stage or or the, the fame or the money or anything like that, that that could come from it. It was always about about the challenge. Yeah, it's the bigger problem to solve. Yeah. You know, it's, because I think what people, and, and guys, just how you might, watching today, how you might apply this to your life, because there are going to be some, some areas I want to touch on that, that are takeaways for you. But one of them is why is martial arts such a, such a potent and powerful um, life-changing and, and character-shaping uh, um, sort of endeavor. And one of the reasons is it's because of the problem-solving. Mm -hmm. There's massive problem-solving to do when you, as you said, enter a space with another human being who's trying to solve the problem of you, mm -hmm. which is to defeat you, mm -hmm. to use all of their experience and their understanding to ultimately dominate you in, in, into submission until you quit or the ref makes you quit, or somebody you know, stops mm -hmm. it. Um, but I think that's a fascinating problem to solve. And I think, as, as just to flesh that out for these guys, if your if your container is jujitsu, then you know there there are certain things you don't have to worry about. Just like boxing, if I'm if I'm boxing, I don't have to worry about being kicked. I don't have to worry about being taken down in wrestling. So when you get in, I, I think what I hope you guys can appreciate in MMA is. Pretty much, there's nothing outside of, you know, uh, gouging someone's eyes and, and certain things. There's pretty much nothing a person can't use, a weapon uh, that they cannot use mm -hmm. on another person. And so the problem becomes massive. Massive, yeah. There's a, <clears throat> it's like controlled chaos, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's such a, a vast universe of possibilities and ways that, you know, uh, like it's unpredictable and with little gloves on you could be a world-class striker um, and have a huge advantage against your opponent technically in, mm -hmm. in that world but if they hit you one good time with those little gloves on it doesn't matter so you see it all the time you know great strikers um, get knocked out by someone that does not have near the accolades that they have in in striking uh, or even great jiu-jitsu guys have a hard time submitting or finishing someone on the ground because it's, you know, there's a time uh, time limit, it's sweaty, it's crazy, and the anxiety and everything, they make a mistake, they lose the position, um, you know, and they're, they have a hard time submitting someone that's not near their level on the ground. Um, and it's happened where even great jiu-jitsu guys have been submitted, um, you know, because... Maybe they take a bad shot because they're they're overwhelmed um, on the feet with the stand up, and so they 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 take a bad a bad you know takedown attempt and land in a guillotine or something. So uh, really, to me, uh, all your skills in in one area, I don't want to say they get thrown out the window uh, necessarily, but um, it's a whole nother it's a whole nother world, you know. So it really doesn't matter how great of a striker you are, how great of a grappler you are. Um, it really just comes down to how great of a mixed martial artist you are. How well mm -hmm. can you put all the disciplines together and mold your game, mold your style, um, and, uh, you know, do damage and not take damage, you know. That's what it comes down to. I recall we were, I think we were in London. I, I, I can't remember it could have been an individual who asked the question to you or, or it could have been an interview, but someone said to you, 
what do you think the difference was in for you in this? Was it was it that you had improved your striking? Was it that you had you know uh, changed? And I re and I recall very clearly you saying, it, it, it's it wasn't any one thing that I did. It was the way I put it all together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was very impressed by that answer. Mm -hmm. I thought it was just a very intelligent, and 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 it was also humble in a way. It wasn't like it wasn't it wasn't this. Oh yeah, you know I went out and you know my striking came up and I was ready. It was more like. No, it's just that I did everything better than he did everything. Right. And I thought that was a very straightforward and honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely in my martial arts experience, uh, especially now having spent so many years as a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and, and I've, I've always been trying to improve, you know. Um, and there comes a point in time where you're not adding more weapons to your game um, necessarily, but you're trying to make the connection stronger, mm -hmm. the, the connection between your, your movements in, and your best positions. Um, he, and, and so I, I think to me, that's what mixed martial arts is mm -hmm. in so many ways, is just how well you can connect and, and flow through all those ranges and all those different uh, elements of combat seamlessly. You know, from mm -hmm. striking to being in the clinch to being against the cage to the takedown to the grappling, grappling with striking with submissions. You know, da 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 da. It's just, um, it, it comes down to connection. How how connected are you between your movements, knowing where you're going to go next, um, and not having to pause between. Okay, now I'm, I'm I'm hitting, and then now I'm going to go for a takedown, and then now we're going to do jujitsu. You know, it has to has to flow mm -hmm. and uh, and that's a big piece of my teachings you know I t I'm always trying to um, show my students how to connect their positions and put it together you know you know what, what comes up for me and I wanted to insert that really quickly because I think it takes us down our first road of of practical application for people because we've got a number of people that are watching um, that are you know part of our extended family here and they're not all martial artists and some of them are yoga teachers and some of them are yoga students and some of them are movement you know enthusiasts but the first takeaway for me that I want to something I want to sort of unpack further is learning how to be a triple threat learning how to connect what may seem these uh, unrelatable or unrelated moving parts. And, and I, I talk about this because, you know, one of our school mottos is the way you do anything is the way you do everything. Mm -hmm. So I love that one. The, and right. It's such a, such a straightforward, honest kind of like a blue collar. It's a blue collar quote. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really like roll your sleeves up. Son, the way you do anything is the way you do everything. Finish yeah. that. Whatever the fuck mm -hmm. that is, finish it. Yeah. Now, when these guys are out there, because I try to relate stuff that might be outside of a person's scope of experience to what they're living you know, in their lives. So no matter what you're doing out there, understanding that, that Raphael's success is in, a, is in large part due to his ability to see the relationship between what seems to be unrelatable things you know, you might think, what is kicking and punching, striking, have to do with wrestling? They're very different. They re you know, really are. Mm -hmm. And yet there's a place where they completely come together and become one mm -hmm. um, and, and transition from mm -hmm. one to the other. Mm -hmm. and, and for folks out there in their lives, I feel like people struggle sometimes to connect these 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 uh, sort of expressions of, of human endeavor, like I always I often tell people when they're coming in for teacher training, I say, I need you to be the scientist, the artist, and the philosopher. Not just the scientist, not just the artist, and not just the philosopher, because mm -hmm. if you're too scientific and you don't have enough art in you, mm -hmm. or you're too philosophical, but you don't have enough grounding to be the scientist, you're not going to be able to put it all together and actually monetize mm -hmm. that talent, mm -hmm. that skill. You've been able to monetize, and I'm, I'm just going to speak plainly, you've been able to turn something 
into a way to make a living, into a way to have a career, mm -hmm. into a way to, 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 to build a life mm -hmm. for yourself. And I think we're all trying to do that. All, when it comes mm -hmm. down to it, it's just survival. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to be happy, have a roof over their head, put, put food on the table. You have done this in such a skillful way. You've taken something and you've learned to become an ex excellent businessman, an excellent artist, an excellent philosopher. And we'll talk about your book that you're writing because I think that'll be interesting as well. But when you think about all the things that you're connecting that, and you start looking at what makes successful people successful, it is their ability to connect these things because being talented isn't enough. Mm -hmm. Being intelligent isn't enough. Being creative isn't enough. It's all of it together. And I'd be curious to hear you speak to that, mm -hmm. to that solving the big problem is putting it all together. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there's several different moments in what you were saying where um, something was coming to my mind. But, uh, you know, as a martial artist, there's basically like three realms. There's the student you, um, and then hopefully at some point in time, there's the, the teacher you, and maybe or maybe not, depending on what kind of person you are and, and what your goals are, there's the, the competitor or the fighter, you know? Um, and for me, uh, that's basically been my whole life. I started, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a forever student, um, and I started teaching at a very young age as well to help my father uh, with our martial arts school I was consistently t teaching adult classes by the time I was 16 years old. Um, so now I have over 20 years of teaching experience. And I've been a competitor as well um, in that whole time. And as I've grown older, I've uh, been able to understand and make the connection that even though they're all different, they're all the same and they all make you better. You know, the, the results that you get through competition and what you experience um, I mean, you learn so much, and then it also guides you into where you need to put your energy to be a better student the next day, the next week, um, because your flaws are going to be exposed, you know? And uh, it says, okay, I, I, I need to work on this area of my practice. And so now you're a better student. And then you take all of that, and you apply it as a teacher, and, and you give back, and you share what you've learned um, and it's just this cycle. And, uh, and for me, that's been my whole life. Every, every piece of who I am inside of myself as a martial artist um, is connected. The teacher, student, competitor, fighter, whatever you want to call it. Um, even though they're each its own little world and, and game, so to speak. Like my game as a teacher, you have to develop your game as a teacher, you know. Um, you have to be the best student you can be and, and create your game, your way of expression um, inside martial arts, inside combat. Um, you know, so each one is very specific, but at the same time, they're all connected and they all make you, a, a, each one makes you better at the other. And what, are, what, are, what are some of the things that have left, and I, it, when I say a thing, that's pretty ambiguous, but what are some of the, the, the aha moments, the takeaway moments, the quotes, the, the, Im the things that have left impressions on you that have been part of the ingredient that makes you a world champion. Because again, I, I always want people to understand what you don't come across a lot of world champions in your life. They're a very small fraction of society. It's like a gold medalist in, in the Olympics. You, you, you're you're going to meet you may never meet a gold medalist. <laughs> you may never meet a real true world champion in, in something. So when you do, it's, there's always, there should be a curiosity and an interest in how this person got to where they got to. So for us to understand a little deeper, what we, cause we can look at your success on the surface and go, Oh, uh, fantastic. And you can say, you know, work hard in this, uh, you know, some of the sort of, a superficial approach, but I'm, I'm curious, what are the small things that, that really stick mm -hmm. with you that mm -hmm. you apply on a mm -hmm. daily basis? Well, I kind of want to say something right off the bat because, um, you know, being that maybe there's some people listening that aren't too familiar with my career and who I am, 
and and you're saying such nice nice things and kind of talking me up it may sound like i i'm just like this guy that just beats everybody and and blah 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 and i've had all this success or whatever but um i mean i've i've lost time and time again you know uh coming up in in brazilian jiu-jitsu and um there's I don't want to say that there's nothing special to me, um, but I'm, I'm a regular guy, you know what I mean? Um, and it's not like I just uh, always win, you know, uh, is what I'm, what I'm getting at. Um, you know, I've lost time and time again. I was never a world champion at the lower ranks. Uh, you know, in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, there's the blue belt, purple belt, brown belt, and then black belt. And... Uh, and, and you competed was, throughout all oh, of yeah, that. Oh, yeah, 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 mm-hmm. since I was a little kid. Um, and I was never a world champion at those lower belt ranks. Um, but then when I got my black belt and, and uh, really started to find my, my full potential, um, I, was, I was able to become a world champion black belt. And so in the end, none of that mattered, you know. Um, and what I'm getting at is – Basically, uh, number one, you got to keep going. You can never quit, um, and you have to learn how to take your failures and um, just use them to to build your path to success, and not and not hinder you, not 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 block you from um, from reaching your full potential, and uh, and that's something that. I don't want to say like was easy for me, but I think I've, I've always done a really good job of just moving forward. I'm always going forward and, uh, and never letting anything break my, my spirit of, you know, am I going to do this? Like there, there were definitely moments, tough moments, tough losses where, um, I would have uh, little breakdowns or whatever and kind of be like, man, I don't know, I don't know, or whatever. Um, but I was always able to shake them off, and the next day, I'm, I'm back to work. And, um, and really, I think that that's part of me being a great student because when you're a forever student and you're, you're fully committed to your craft and your passion and wanting to get better, and when you're in something like martial arts where you're constantly reminded that you can be better. Um, and that you can be beaten. And that you can be beaten. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, you, you, have to, you have to take all of that and say, okay, I'm just going to keep working and keep learning and learning and learning and learning. And me, I was just never afraid to challenge myself and put myself um, in, a, in a vulnerable position where, you know, I might lose. Um, how, do you, how do you find that kind of courage? When pe- there are a lot of people who don't have the, the courage is not something that, that comes to them uh, naturally I, I know that's such an sort of it's a bit of a it's a bit of a, a philosophical mm-hmm. sort of uh, direction but what do you say to what do you personally say to a person mm-hmm. who is struggling to find courage well uh, there's definitely an element of um, that's just part of who you are, right? I mean, for me, I love having a challenge. I just, I love knowing that on a specific date, you know, there's going to be people coming after me and um, I need to be at my best. I need to show my work. I need to show my art. I'm going to express myself. I'm going to be challenged. And um, it, that, that, that drives me, you know, that I love that feeling um, day to day of having something that I'm working towards on a competitive level like that. Um, does does and, that have anything to do with your childhood? Yeah, one hundred percent. This is a big. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so much of like proving, proving. It's my father. Okay. One hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He's very driven. He. Because we all have that. We yeah. all we all have mm-hmm. something mm-hmm. driving us. Yes, you're. One hundred percent. But like going to the way you asked me like what would I tell to someone you know I'm I'm always um, kind of developing and harnessing my students and and, and helping them um, you know find their 
their competitor, you know, uh, that person on the inside that that um, is almost like the the superhero version of themselves is the way I, I call it. Because when you when you step into uh, a combat arena, you know, um, in a competitive environment like that, you can't be your normal day to day you. Uh, mm. You know, you you have to transform into mm. the superhero version of you. Mm-hmm. And what does that look like? How does that like flesh that out a little bit? That's an interesting, you know. Well, the the number one thing that I I tell my students, and you know, as you said, how do you gain the courage? Mm-hmm. You got to know your why. You know, mm-hmm. what is your inspiration? Mm-hmm. What is what is motivating you to be practicing the art to begin with? You know, mm-hmm. um, what what pushes you? What what whenever you see a a movie or uh, you read a good book, a quote, um, you know, some sort of video that inspires you what is it what is it about that video that inspires you and makes you want to do something um and so number one understanding your inspiration you know um and what is your why and i think that is the beginning of you tapping into finding how courageous you really are Mm -hmm. and uh and how powerful you really are whenever you first understand your why um, and can you practice courage? I mean, can that be something that oh, yeah. is a developed I believe, skill? I believe 100%. You know, every day in training in martial arts, you you might get hit in a moment where it's like there's a question, ah, do I really want to do this next round? Do I really want to go with that person? I'm feeling a little tired. I'm feeling this way, that way. Maybe you had a rough day, your mind, you know, and you have to – uh, center yourself and, and you know, um, put yourself in a place where you're like, okay, yes, keep going, you know. Um, so, yes, I, I, I believe you can practice courage. I believe you can you can uh, build yourself up and, uh, and, and, and find strength on a daily basis. You're always, I mean, look at what's going on in the world, right? I mean, at any point in time, you can be in a moment where you want to break mm-hmm. and, you um, and martial arts, the problem solving, you can stop and, all right, let me think about how I'm reacting right now, my attitude, um, and try to correct wherever you might be slipping off. Um, so, yes, I think you can practice it. But Are you always, are you, are you scared? Do you feel that you're afraid when you are about to compete? Do you feel fear? Yes, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, not 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 in everything. Jiu-jitsu, mm-hmm. not really. Okay. Um, but MMA, one hundred percent. Being in the cage is definitely the scariest thing I've ever done. Mm-hmm. Um, also, the the funnest and just, I mean, it's it's a rush, it's a ride, it's it's addicting. It's, but at the same time, yes, it's it's very fearful. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's an extreme sport. Uh, you can get hurt. Bad things can happen. Mm-hmm. Um, you're so vulnerable, you know, your people are going to see who you are and how you react, you know, and so there's uh, a very scary piece of just like, you know, uh, what are people going to think? How am I going to look? All that sort of, what if I get knocked out on national or international TV? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's very fearful, but right before I'm walking out or when I'm backstage and when I'm in the cage, you don't feel that fear. You know, you you tap into your inspiration, what you're there for, what's your why, and you transform. You're the superhero version of yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, Do you say things to yourself? 100%. 100%. Mm-hmm. So going back to how we were initially getting there, building that courage. So I have I, – I kind of break it down to into four words um, that I, I use in my teachings to help my students, and it, obviously I apply for myself – um, number one, knowing your why, okay? What is your inspiration? Um, number two, having a sense of, uh, a very strong, strong sense of gratitude um, for, for everything, you know? And when I'm getting ready to walk into the cage, I can look back, I can look around me, I can look inside and have a deep sense of gratitude for being able to live this life that I love um, live my passion, be surrounded by 
amazing people. You know, I'm looking around. I see you. I see Shanji. I see my father. My father was in my corner for all my fights. Mm-hmm. Um, all of my, uh, basically the greatest gifts that martial arts has, has given to me, these people mm-hmm. um, that I consider family, um, you know, they, they give me strength and the gratitude for my body, um, for being healthy, being able to practice, being able to challenge myself in an arena of any sort is a gift, you know, because I'm going to learn, I'm going to be better for it. Um, that gratitude is is very important because then uh, how am I going to feel anything else, but, you know, but, but happy and, and excited for the opportunity. It's an Mm. opportunity, you know? Mm. Um, so inspired, grateful, Mm. happy. I just said it, you know, Mm. uh, is a, is a big piece of it as well. Um, I try to remember to smile. There are different moments where we're about to walk out there and get after it. And I just like, you know, I see, I see my father, I see these guys and, and I just want to smile and just like, man, I love these guys. You know, um, how amazing is it for us to, to be here, you know, be in the moment, you know, Mm -hmm. and all that, it all wraps together. You know, it's essentially the same thing. Um, the connection, right? It's all connected. And then from there, you're going to be confident, you know, uh, and that's the last piece, being confident. Um, with that takes the, the, the self-talk. You know, where is your self-talk? What are you saying? But if, you're, if, you're, if you know your why and your self-talk is, is connected to that, you know, you know what you're there for and you're grateful and you're happy and you can look at your work um, and the months or whatever, the weeks that um, – that you spent focused, disciplined, and committed to being at your best, um, then you could be confident, you know. Uh, how, how, if I could, I just would like to insert a question there. How important or potent do you consider self-talk? It's everything. It's, it's everything. It's, it's Maybe you could just sort of flush that out a bit. Or well, it, it's or just... Your mental state controls everything. Um, you may be very physically prepared, very technically prepared. You may be better than your opponent in those areas, better, the better athlete, the better technician. But if your mind is somewhere else and you're not, you're not in the moment, you're not confident, you're not focused, um, you, know, you can fall apart. It doesn't matter. Um, and at the same time, that can be flipped. You might not have had the best camp. <laughs> I mean, look at what happened to us in London. Mm-hmm. Um, you can overcome anything physically, injuries, um, whatever outside obstacles or, or things that you have to go through. You might not even be the better technician. Um, your opponent may have technical huge technical advantages Mm -hmm. but if they're not quite tuned in to why they want to be there and you are um and you know 100 percent that you are not gonna you're you're not gonna break and you're gonna keep going um when things get rough you know when things get get close and you're in a in a battle and you have to dig dig deep if they if they if they're not ready to dig deep, and you are, you're going to win. What kinds of things do you find you say to yourself? Do you have memories of saying things to yourself in the midst of a full fight? I mean, like when you're in oh, a position, yeah. like you start to, you have dialogue? 100%. 100%. Okay. Um, you know, it's all, you trust yourself. You have to trust your instincts, trust your, your training. Um, but yes, like, for example... Um, the the title fight in London. Two rounds for me, two rounds for him. Mm-hmm. It's coming down to the fifth round. I'm hearing Marisu, I'm hearing Shanji, and they're basically like pumping me up, saying we need you to dig deep right now. Mm-hmm. This is it. This is it. This, this is yeah, it. not going to be another moment. This like is the this, last yeah. five minutes, you know, and and I I'm getting off that stool, waiting for the bell to ring. 
and I'm selling myself last round, best round, last round is my best round. And that's, as you're that, repeating that, that's last not, round is my best round. That's not round. something I just did right there, spur of the moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see me, you, mm -hmm. you saw in all the camps, um, whenever it's coming down to my last round of sparring, you know, my last round of conditioning, my last round of sprints, my last mm -hmm. round of anything, mitt work, whatever it may be, mm -hmm. I'm always trying to end stronger than I started. Yeah, I remember. And I tell myself that, and I yeah. pump myself up, and I raise my hand. Yes, yes. You do several things that are interesting to me since I started um, being a part of your team. You know, every, every time you finish, you always raise your hand uh, as if you have won. You know, regardless, uh, you stand up, you walk around the room, um, which is very interesting to me. Um, it's sort of a ritual, rituals that I've, I've witnessed, but always raising your hand at the end. And we're talking just training. So just in case you guys uh, are uh, unclear on that, we're talking about just practice rounds, just anything that that's, you know, he's, he's, he walks around. But I'm on Boom. a mission. Oh, 100%. I'm on a mission, you know, and, and yeah. there's a very emotional connection. Like even just talking about this right now, I can, I can get very emotional because mm -hmm. there's, there's deep, a deep feeling behind it. Mm -hmm. and it and there has to be there has to be you know so talking going back to what I was talking about before the the inspiration being number one knowing your why mm -hmm. you have to have that I mean if it doesn't make you cry you don't mm -hmm. want it bad enough <laughs> the thought right. of of achieving your your chief objective mm -hmm. if it doesn't make you break down and just you know, then no, that, you that, really don't want it bad no, enough. I love it. I love that. I love that for, for you guys out there who are just sort of tuning in today. If, if you don't, if it doesn't make you want to cry, if you don't come to tears, imagining yourself succeeding at what you're, what you're uh, out there, you know, saying that you're inspired to achieve, then you, you don't mean it. Mm -hmm. And that's the bottom line. You just don't mean it. And I, there's another thing that, that Mauricio would say, one of my favorite things, when you would be, uh, let's say you were at the end of a round, you'd be exhausted, you, you, you know, and these guys, just to give some insight and said, you know, um, Rafael will go into uh, a training session and he'll roll with a fresh partner back to back. So he's, he's, the, he's the constant, but the variable is partners, they're changing. And they're always, they get to rest, they get to get water, they get, and Rafael just keeps going and gets grinded on. And Mauricio, sometimes, you know, you're exhausted. And my favorite thing, my favorite thing that Mauricio says, it'll be with me. I would love to put it on his headstone one day, but he always say, believe, believe. And I, and I love that when he says that to you, when you're on the bottom, he just says, believe. And I'm it's so fucking powerful. Mm -hmm. Believe, believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. Believe you can get up. Mm -hmm. Finish this round on top. Believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I fucking love it. Mm -hmm. it it's, it's you huge. have to be, you have to have unbreakable positivity, you know, uh, every day, every training, like I said, you're on a mission and, and you have to believe and nothing can break your spirit and things are going to happen. You know, uh, like I said, I lost time and time again, my career was built off of losing mm -hmm. and the fact that I just kept going that's what led me to winning, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, especially in the time that I came up in, in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, we didn't have access. I'm from Oklahoma and, and Jiu Jitsu was just coming to the U S. Um, it was very far. We, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't have the access. Um, and so w there was always a big disadvantage, uh, for me. Um, everyone had black belt instructors, not everyone, but, you know, competing against Brazilians and Brazilian teenagers and Brazilians my whole life who were in academies with multiple black belts or um, lots of great training partners um, and surrounded by uh, other competitors and, and people that were on the same mission as them and, and things like that. Um, you know, and then me kind of being on my own. In fact, most of the events that I went to, I was traveling by myself and uh, yeah, really... I'll I'm sorry. I, I just I think they they need to know this because it's so important. Is that because you guys 
but there's something that I think is information that matters. When Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu started, um, of course, its origin is Brazil. So you've got all these competitors who have the advantage of learning from the <clears throat> the, the 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 masters, the the innovators of the sport. And then you've got this kid, Rafael, here in Oklahoma, has no access to the, the you know, Brazilian uh, uh, masters. Uh, m m really, he doesn't even live in a city where there's. No, it's a miracle. Yeah, where, like <laughs> yeah but I want to say where there's no jujitsu. He and his dad are driving. What, what would what would you drive? How far? Well, first, my father was going to California. Right. And he, he doesn't fly. So he was driving from Oklahoma to California to learn and train and drive back home. And I did that drive with him at least two times. Um, and there was one time where I flew to California and then drove back with him. Um, and this is just to, st just to spend a little bit of time yeah. studying with a teacher. We had, that's where we had to go. Yeah. It was either going to be California or Florida or New York. And then they would have to come so back So we were home. right in the middle. So right. everything was far. Yeah, and then you'd have to come back home and practice together on our own. You didn't. It's not like you had a school to come back to, full of jujitsu. Yeah. We never had a mentor. Yeah. We never had a teacher on a daily basis to guide us. We would go and get some pieces, you know, mm -hmm. some information, and we would come home and have to work it out ourselves. And immediately we would have questions. And I have stacks of notebooks um, while we were practicing, while we were training, while we were trying to apply everything that we had just learned or he had just learned um, and something wouldn't work or we would forget a detail or, you know, whatever. We were on our own. <laughs> um, I would just, write down. Yeah. I would write down the question. Okay, this is something I want to get clarified. I had this question. I had that question. Being the best student I could be. And then the next trip that we would make, Boom. As soon as I'm on the mat with a black belt or someone that can answer my questions, I'm like, okay, here we go. And of course, we were doing private lessons as well. <laughs> You're like, yeah. This is, this is, or if I just saw something, yeah. we're watching tapes, VHS tapes. Mm. If we saw something that we didn't quite understand or really we needed to feel or we needed someone to break it down to us better, uh, we write it down. What is this? I didn't want to not yeah. understand everything. And, and, and then it was just a never ending effect you know, that happened over and over again. So yeah. the fact that we were on our own mm -hmm. molded me into a very great student mm -hmm. because I had to be, it was force, you know? And nowadays people have these incredible teachers and instructors on- Yeah, on world, world champions in world, their cities. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and world class just- And they don't bring a fucking notebook to class. They don't have questions. They don't have a question. They, they don't, they're not appreciated. Um, unbelievable, it's, it's yeah. un, it, it, it's very unappreciated because yeah. they they yeah. know it's going to be there the next day, every day. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll ask them tomorrow. I'll ask them next week. But they don't ask at all. Um, they just, they're very much going through the motions. It's just, I go in. Uh, it's 6 o'clock class. I yeah. train for two hours. Yeah. I leave. I'll be back tomorrow. And that's it. They're not plugging in and trying to understand, um, you know. They don't know why they're there. Yes. Just back what, what, to your what, point. what is your focus? When you I was here? on the mat, yeah. I was focused. I yeah. knew exactly what I wanted to learn, what I was working on, what the questions I was going to ask because I didn't take it for granted. I, I, I knew that eventually in a week or whatever, I was going to be back home by myself again. And, uh, and then that, that really developed me into a great teacher as well mm -hmm. because, um, you know, I, I wanted everyone around me to know what I knew so they could push me um, uh, as, a, as a competitor. And uh, uh, our, our mutual brother, uh, Sean Chihibeto, he has a very similar story um, as well. And he's one of the legends, one of the best of the best of the best. Seven time world and, champion. And, and, and Brazilian so, yeah. Jiu Jitsu. He was also very much on his own. And, and then there were times eventually down the line where it was just he and I together. Um, and not every day, mm -hmm. but we knew how to make the most out of our training. We knew how to get the most out of it. And he was, when we weren't together, he was focused on developing his students um, the same way I was mine. 
into our best training partners. You know, they were our best training partners, and we could um, find, okay, you have this body type. I want to teach you this to make you good at this. So now I have someone to push me in that game whenever I know I need it. I need someone that's good at this, someone that's good at that, and this, and that, and this, and that. Um, and so I can say, all right, now I'm going to, I want you to put me in your strongest position, you know, and you figure out how to train, you figure out how to get the most out of your training. Um, you know, and, and a lot of that comes down to limiting yourself and putting yourself in the other person's best positions. But I made them that way, you know, for me, but it, it's this, this, this circle, the connection, everything connected. Would you not say that you can tell, I, I, for me at least, I can tell the commitment, I can tell the level of awareness of why in a student when they show up just by the fact whether they bring a notebook or not. Yeah. I have people come to do a teacher training course with me and will not That's insane. have a fucking notebook in front and of how them. much money do they invest it's to be there? It's unbelievable. I sit down and I look at them and I think, you're gonna. You, I'm sorry. I didn't get that you had a photographic <laughs> memory in your yeah in your in your application, and I, I I'm shocked by it. They come in. I'm like, you don't have a notebook. How are you gonna remember all that I'm about to teach mm -hmm. you? They because they already they've already made a decision before that moment even started. They've already made a decision that they're there to get what they want to get. They've already decided before they've arrived that there's this information. They'll take what they want. They'll leave behind. And that, and, and that they're, they're, they're basically holding themselves to their own standard. They don't even imagine that they're going to be held to my standard. Mm. And so they're shocked when I go, are you fucking joking with me right now? Get up. Go get a notebook. I don't care if you have to tear a leaf off a tree and sketch it with a <laughs> rock now that you don't have a notebook with you, you know, but figure it out. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I find it incredible. Yeah. You yeah. have to be fully plugged in. And there's so much power in putting it into words, mm -hmm. you know, putting it down. 100%. Having such a that, difference. Yeah. Having that resource as well where you can just read through it and, and get those mental reps and put yourself back in that place. You know, if they write it down, they could uh, remember and have that like, okay, yeah, I remember being on the mat. Uh, Concho was right there. He was talking about this. That was a moment. And boom, it, it, it resonates with you. It's deeper. It's more. You can go back. You can see. Well, and then it, you'll, you know, you'll, yeah. you'll, you'll, if they're moving, if they're training, if whatever it may be, um, it's there. You know, mm -hmm. they can tap back into that. Yes, this is it. This is what he was talking about, mm -hmm. you know. And I have that with you. I, I mean, I, I have that. I take so many notes and I have, I have this, I have this. Uh, people are spoiled. List, yeah, yeah, I have this <laughs> list of things that I'm like, okay. And, and, and I expect that at any moment you would say, let me see your notes from the last time. And that you would look and say, okay, let's see if you've improved, if this stuff has changed. Because I know I put mm -hmm. time into it. Because as soon as I get home, I start teaching it to Melaine, yeah. and I, I start I, I start working it. So one myself, thing that I'll yeah. do with my students, um, especially my more advanced guys, um, and my competitors, I'll just ask them, "Okay, what are you working on? What are you working on right now? Mm -hmm. Like, what are you really trying to develop right now?" Um, and you'd be surprised. I mean, you, you won't be surprised, but a lot of times I can't answer that question. Oh, I'm, I just want to be better. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I say the same thing to people when they come here and I say, what are you working on as a human being? Mm -hmm. what, what, what right now are you trying to change about yourself? What are your, what are you focused on? What areas about your personal development, your character, are not working for you and that you're clearly working on adjusting in yourself. And they'll look at me. I've had people look at me and say, you know, because we'll go around in a circle and I'll give each person a moment to talk about what they're personally working on. And I'll get to a person and they'll go, 
I'm not I'm really, good. I'm good. I'm cool. <laughs> I'm just like, fuck, I want to be married to you. What do you, you rip a man. Wow. I'm pretty, what, I'm pretty perfect I'm right pretty now. I'm pretty fucking awesome. Yeah. I mean, there's not much going. Yeah. It's shocking. And it happens. Yeah. It really happens. It's not, it's not comedy. It's real. And you're like, wow, man, you don't, you don't even, you don't even, I mean, but again, I, it can't be surprising in the, the, the world we live in right now where there are so many distractions from personal development. Personal development almost feels like it's not a part of survival anymore because survival is how am I going to make money? How am I going to, you know, pay the bills and, 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 and monetize my, my skills? And it doesn't, it doesn't occur to people that there's still something about who you are that, that has a great impact on what you become and what your potential is. And I'm talking about the who of you, the, you know, your, your etiquette, your manners, your thoughtfulness, attitude. your attitude. Yeah. Oh, attitude. yeah. Who, who are you developing you to be? Because, because when you stack talent on top of that, it becomes a nuclear bomb. You know what I mean? And that, that's how I see you. All this talent coupled with all of this development of, of, of humanity, of, of, of character, uh, of this man so, so well, so, so, so thoughtfully, you know, in a, in a, in a state of, of personal development, coupling that with his, with his talent that he's developing mm -hmm. as well. And that's what makes somebody like you, you, and then somebody who's, you know, performing at this level, them. And, and I think people just don't understand. So, some people just don't understand why some people are living in greatness and some people are living in mediocrity. And there is, there is a real sincere, I don't wanna know if it's a formula, mm -hmm. but there's a, there's a way to actually, to, to deconstruct the strategies and tactics that get you to greatness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And part of it is fucking character development. Mm -hmm. Who are you? Mm -hmm. Well, you have to keep learning. Yeah. You have to keep learning and being challenged. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're lucky that we are living our, our passions and we're always going to be trying to improve on our craft. Um, and then we can also understand how everything that you go through in that process, um, you know, you're not just learning movement or techniques or whatever. Uh, you learn things about yourself and how you deal with the obstacles and uh, the failures um, and everything that that happens along the way and that's where you can develop your character and find out who you are and, and um, hopefully try to become better a better person through it um, but I, I think if, if you don't have something that is pushing you in that way where you're a student where you're putting your ego off to the side um, and being challenged and looking up to someone as your teacher, you know, uh, that's one thing. A lot of martial artists aren't, they hit a certain level and maybe they're not quite the student that they used to be anymore. They're, they're not actively learning or developing the same way they used to or, or going outside the comfort zone. That's a big, big part of what I teach, the big part of my book, you know, getting outside of your comfort zone mm -hmm. um, so you can spark that growth again and, and learning. Uh, when I'm doing yoga mobility with you, I mean, my goodness, I'm, I'm, I'm down here. <laughs> You're way up there, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's, I'm definitely obviously going to be more comfortable if we have our geese on and yeah, we're doing choking me. Yeah, you're <laughs> yeah, always more yeah. comfortable choking me, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm just going to finish your sentence. But that's the I'd thing. I'd be more comfortable if I was. And, right. and we could say the same thing vice versa, right? Yeah. But uh, that's, you know, the beauty of, of, of our relationship. And, you know, going back to what you were talking about, the more that you start to put those things together and kind of see the, the recipe, so mm -hmm. to speak, um, you come in contact with like it, the, the these people just fall right into your path 
and you make the connection and it's like destiny man and and because you don't you, have to and, you, and, and so now yeah. my inspiration isn't just internal i'm mm -hmm. inspired by everybody around me mm -hmm. i you know uh, as, as the time mm -hmm. passes you realize how special certain people are and as you get more on that wavelength and you have that attitude and that that vibe that energy going other people will will come to you and then you're you can see it mm -hmm. you're willing you're accepting to see mm -hmm. and i'm willing to be a student i'm willing to put myself in that position you know what i'm going to give that a try mm -hmm. let me see what he has to say let me see who this person is yeah. and then i make another connection now i have a new inspiration mm -hmm. a new a new teacher mm -hmm. you know and a new weapon like mm -hmm. you're a weapon you make me stronger you mm -hmm. know and you can find that more and more and more in everything in life even when it's the darkest moments right like uh, in the middle of, of difficulty lies opportunity, you know? Uh, yeah, because a lot of people don't know, but when, 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 when we finally, um, um, I, I started with you, uh, it, 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 when you, when you um, brought me onto the team, uh, you, were, you were just sort of uh, starting your Bellator run, and you, you know, you were defeating, yeah. Yeah, 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 you were defeating, you were defeating, uh, guys and, 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 and wow, it was like, whoa, this, you know, suddenly it looked like, you know, you, we're heading towards, towards a title fight and right at the title fight. And I, cause I just want to make these guys aware of this. Um, Raphael gets, gets news that he has a, what's the right term, a, a, a brain Condition, condition. Disease, let's, disease. Call it, let's call it a yeah. condition, a brain condition where, where the, the athletic commission that regulates uh, the safety for fighters and whether they can fight and, and based on um, their health and their wellness, somebody's decided that you may not be, uh, it may not be safe for you to fight for the title fight that you've earned for, from your whole life for years and years and years, the, the final, the, the sort of the, the crescendo of your career, the moment that's sort of defining everything that you've worked for, uh, two weeks, you didn't find out, we didn't find out, was it right up to two weeks whether you were going to be able to actually fight. We were already in fight camp. We were, tickets were bought. You, I mean, I, he, he's... He's doubled down on everything. It's like everything's done. It'd be like planning a wedding and you're in it. You know, like you're. And fully. I didn't even tell you until we got to London. Remember? And it's true. And he didn't even. T yeah, correct. He didn't even tell me. We got to London and he's like, "Well, by the way, we almost didn't. This almost didn't happen because the the doctors were not going to let you fight. Pick it up from there." Yeah. Uh, definitely the most difficult time of my life. Um, it was six weeks before the fight when I did the, the brain scan. And the reason why all of this happened, uh, I never had any issues. I've never had any problems, never been knocked out. I, I hardly ever even get a headache. Um, so I never had a reason to believe that there was something wrong with my, my brain, or my head. Um, and this was the first time where I was required to do a brain scan in order to get approved to fight. So every other uh, location uh, or venue that I had fought at, um, the athletic commission in that state never required us as fighters to get a brain scan done. Of course, we would get a, a physical and blood work and da-da-da-da. We had to do tests and do all that. But um, the, was brain scan, the brain to scan was a 100% was a new thing. Europe that, thing? That was... Uh, a Europe requirement okay, okay. Um, for the for the UK, which is another interesting thing that you would have never even yeah. found out you and had you know, this issue. And, well, I don't want to go off yet, um, right. but the whole destiny stuff was really crazy for this. But uh, um, so six weeks before the fight, I'm getting ready to go to Brazil. All right, let me get this brain scan done so I can turn it in, and I'm going to go to Brazil for my next phase of camp, and uh, and that's where. You know, I'm, I'm not going to try to make this a super long story, but that's where it was discovered. I found out, okay, there's something wrong. I didn't even know what it was exactly. The, the radiologist or whatever, the, 
you know, the person that did the MRI, um, they were like, uh, something's wrong here. I, you know, and I, I need this paper signed. <laughs> You're like, <laughs> like, right. can you sign the paper? Yeah, because I got to get into my fight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I need it just London get approved. I need to get that. approved. And they're yeah. like, uh, there's no way I can sign this. You need to see somebody. You need to see a specialist. You have, I, they, they thought, they weren't even sure. Um, yeah, here you are of, on a casual okay. day just getting, your, just getting your blood work, paperwork done. And the next thing you know, somebody's telling you you have a, you have a, you have a brain disease, some yeah. type of serious. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then the whole thing started and, uh, you know, I'm six weeks away from the fight right in the middle of camp where I need to be focused <laughs> and I need to be, um, in a great place mentally. Um, and num number one, I'm concerned about my health and I'm trying to do research about this condition that I have and understand it more and just process it and figure out okay, uh, am, I, am I hurting myself? Am I, you know, am I putting myself at a risk that isn't worth it? Um, so I'm trying to process all that. And then if I manage to somehow process that and say, okay, no, we're okay, we're okay, you're going to be fine, da, 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 and somehow not let that get me down, then I, I still have to process and, and manage to stay you know, okay um, with the fact that I don't know if I'm even going to fight, you know, and it's in someone else's hands. Are and you frightened? Did, well, did I'm trying to go day by day and work hard and da-da-da-da, mm -hmm. and, and I don't even know if I'm going to get approved. I don't even know if it's going to happen. On a personal level, though, are you frightened that you've just found out that you have a brain? I was. Yeah. I was, and I took off to Brazil. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so... Like to immediately, go get the next day, the next day, I took off to Brazil. Right. To go get um, so in I'm, the on face, a, I'm on a, I'm on a, a ten hour flight, just thinking. You know, the phone's in airplane mode. I can't talk to anyone by myself, and I'm just thinking, and thinking, and thinking. And then I'm in Brazil, and I have, you know, I have friends down there, but in many ways, I'm very much by myself. Um, you know, I don't have a home there, and blah 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 blah. But Shanji did spend time with me there. And then he would, he had other things, other, he was traveling for seminars. And so I'd had weekends by myself down there. And there were a lot of moments where I was just left with my own thoughts. Um, and I was every, every day. I mean, we do a lot of sparring down there. Um, and I was like, man, every time I'm getting hit in the head, am I getting one step closer to, you know, I kept thinking of Muhammad Ali. I kept mm -hmm. seeing that. And, Interesting. And I was like, mm -hmm. oh. Like you, you know, and I want to have a family. I want right. to, I want to, I want to be a, a grandfather one day. You know, mm -hmm. I want to, of course, father, grandfather. I want to be able to grow old and be healthy. And so that there definitely was that fear. Mm -hmm. um, and then as we're trying to, to see doctors and basically find someone that would say, yes, it's okay. I think you should, you can fight. You know, um, I'm getting a so many no's and I'm hearing so many doctors and it's got to be frightening for a, a body of, of experts to tell you that if you get hit in the head you could die you well they could. weren't saying that necessarily but but isn't that what's implied by not letting you fight there yeah I mean I'm not saying I don't, I don't know that, that that's for, that's the extreme that's the extreme right. worst possibility worst, yeah, but, worst but, case. but that's what they're basing this mm -hmm. on they're basing it on what's the worst thing that mm -hmm. could happen to this guy if so my, my condition is yeah. called cavernoma. Okay. Um, and so now, now I know quite a bit about it, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, it's not as rare as, as what you might think. Like mm -hmm. right now they say one in 500, but that's just because that those people had a reason to get a scan done. Right. How many people and get brain scans? There, there, there are a lot of yeah. people that have cavernoma that are asymptomatic. I'm asymptomatic. I don't have symptoms at least not yet. Mm -hmm. um, that could change, but as of now, I don't have a symptom. Besides being um, just incredibly intelligent, which could be a, <laughs> which could be a symptom of... You know, I wouldn't say that, but... You know, um, I was really talking about myself, but go ahead. <laughs> uh, you know, really like the, the symptoms that can occur, of course, um, headaches, things like that, and mm -hmm. then as it gets more and more extreme, um, what it is, that there, there's these formations of extra blood vessels in my brain mm -hmm. and they can kind of like 
wrap and vine up together. Like a clot yeah. concept. Okay. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And as they vine up, um, they can ooze blood. Mm -hmm. They don't just bleed. Um, mm -hmm. It's very little by little over time. Mm -hmm. um, and for some people, it can be very extreme. They have many cavernoma locations. I, I have more than one. I have several. Mm -hmm. um, and one of them is, is good size and the others are mid to small size. Um, but on the extreme end, people will have, you know, several big ones in locations that are very, very risky. Mm -hmm. uh, and what happens is they'll end up with vision problems. They'll get paralyzed on one side, mm -hmm. um, maybe end up in a coma. They have regular seizures and it can be very scary. Probably on, very on strong, some pharmaceuticals, life, yeah. lifelong. And it's very, yeah. It can, yeah, and that's the extreme end. And I was reading about those extremes um, and, and children being born with this and having problems at a very young age and having to do multiple surgeries, even dying. Um, and that's the kind of stuff I was seeing when I was in the middle of all this. And so, yes, I was very fearful, but I came to a place where I said, look, I can't not do this fight. I've already done nine fights up to that point right i've been hitting my head my whole life pretty much um i made it that far i i kind of got over the risk mm -hmm. even though doctors were saying no mm -hmm. and there was a bit of fear for my health of course um i got over that and i and i kind of said look if i can only get this one if, if this is the last fight i'm ever able to do i need this fight i need we work so hard to get here. Um, this is it, and this is what I dreamed of, and not only for the title, but for the opportunity to fight someone of that caliber who was considered one of the best and had that ultimate challenge. Not even that it's just for the belt, but it was also who it was against that I really mm -hmm. needed to be able to say I, I, w I was at least there, win or lose, I don't care. Mm -hmm. I need to know I was in there, and I gave my best, and. I had that opportunity at least I, yeah I don't think people understand what most people have never faced something as as severe like the obstacle in front of you to achieve this lifelong dream and goal the obstacle placed in front of you wasn't merely um, effort you needed to put forward it wasn't merely work ethic it wasn't it wasn't oh I, I I need to earn some money. I need to create this. I need to create that. It wasn't. It wasn't this. Um, it wasn't an obstacle that was was the normal or average obstacle. You're talking about someone looks at you and says, you know, worst case scenario, you could die here. Um, best case scenario, you'll be you know you'll be fine. Middle of the road scenario is you know you might have some some brain impact, some injury, some 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 stuff that could, you know, could carry on after the fight. And I think it's fascinating because a lot of times when people think of things to overcome, you know, when you, when you go out in the fight, my favorite thing to say to you, because it's the thing that's the most, the most um, sincere and honest thing about you is I, I always say to you, nobody's tougher than you because that's just how I see you. And I'll look and I, I, nobody's tougher than you. Nobody's tougher than you. And sometimes I'll just say that, and you know, when we're back, and, and I, you know, I'm like, nobody's tougher than you. And you're reminding yourself, yeah. no one's tougher than him. Yeah, he's he's going to be okay. That's <laughs> it. Maybe I'm, yeah, maybe I'm making myself feel better. I'm like, nobody's tougher than him. But I do. I look and I, and I think that sincerely. And I think your mental toughness, your mental durability is so impressive to me so incredible that I th that this is just another testament to that that you are two weeks out from the di most difficult fight of your life in an, in a ring with a with a notorious killer a notoriously legendary MMA fighter very dangerous guys knocked out a lot of people and you've got to go in and fight this guy you are by the way he's got what I don't know 40 over 50 fights. Over 50 professional fights. You, at this time, in MMA, have 
This will be my 10th. <laughs> your 10th fight. You know, you, you, it's, there's really no comparison, really. And you've got to go fight this guy with all of these obstacles. And I'm, it just, it, it's always impressed me how you were able to stay so zen mind through that. I mean, and again, knowing that. But how was a mess? Right. That's the I'm, thing. Yeah. I don't, yeah. like, going back yeah. again, I mean, we're all human. Um, you know, and it's it, sometimes it's it's too easy to look at, look up to someone. Um, but most people would who, quit. Well, and, know? and, and in, in in any any walk of life, it's easy yeah. to look up to to that person and put them in this uh, unattainable level. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I was a mess. I was mm -hmm. crying every day. You know, I was mm -hmm. FaceTiming um, my fiance and uh, like just. Uh, like petting your dog <laughs> and I was just like why is this <laughs> happening you know uh, but I was surrounded by the right people mm -hmm. um, and we we put ourselves in a place where it's like well we're gonna do whatever we have to do mm -hmm. and we're gonna keep going we're just gonna keep going I kept seeing doctor after doctor after doctor until I finally saw a doctor who had a lot of experience uh, with people with my condition and he was the first one to say look uh, your your my condition could take could take a turn for the worse at any point in time um, I mean that's that's the reality um, you know it's possible I could go the rest of my life never having one symptom it's possible that tomorrow something could happen I could have a seizure tomorrow and things could change it, it, you don't know and there's no data there's no um, uh, studies or anything to reinforce that me getting hit in the head is going to necessarily make it worse. Mm -hmm. And because I'm asymptomatic and I'm healthy and never had a problem and I already had all those fights, he was like, look, I don't see a problem with it. You should live your life. Um, and there's no way we can say that uh, this next punch is going to be the one, you know. Uh, it, you could, like I said, go the rest of my life and never have an, a problem. Mm -hmm. And that was that first bit of hope. And it was like, okay, so will you sign my paper? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> will you write the letter will that we you need? Say we can, and, I and, can go risk and then my we, life. we had it and we turned it in. And then it was like a big burst of life. And right after I saw that doctor, I'll never forget that moment, man. I just, I broke down and, and me and Mauricio, we had a, as soon as we walked out of the office, right by the elevator, this is in Brazil, right by the elevator to go back down we just embraced each other and we were crying and, and he was just like, it, that's the first bit of like, we're gonna do this. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the belief, mm -hmm. it kicked in right there. We have, we have the doctor mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's gonna happen. It started, started happening. It was like mm -hmm. the, 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 the momentum began there. But then we still had to wait for the commission. We turned everything in and we still have to wait for them to say yes. Now is a whole nother thing. So eventually they did, as you said, two weeks before the fight. So from six weeks to two weeks, a month, a full month, I was left in limbo, mm -hmm. you know, not knowing if it was even going to happen. Mm -hmm. But here's the, the reason or, or what I believe is like, um, you know, the, the destiny behind it. All of that took place. So I was completely tuned in into all those other things I talked about, my why, um, you know, and the gratitude, the gratitude and yeah. everything. I was so, I mean, of course, it was already a title fight, already a huge fight, and I'm this big underdog and everything else. So no matter what, I was going to have to find that. But then this other thing happened where it was like right here and now, you know, I had to dig deep already six weeks before the fight even took place I already had to start to dig deep 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 and then it all clicked when that fifth round happened was coming it was like I went through all of that so I I could be the stronger man right now you know I knew why I want why I was there and uh, and for him it was just another fight for me it was it was everything something yeah. much more and I think that was interesting uh, if, if you guys are, are to, you know, paying attention. If you ever want to go back and watch that fight, I don't, is that fight watchable? Yeah, it's them? on YouTube. So you can go on YouTube. 
um, right after this, if you want to go watch this fight, um, just so you have a little context, the fight, again, Rafael's not supposed to win this fight. He is considered a massive underdog. He's considered um, to be, a, you know, just not, not, the, not the caliber of MMA fighter that uh, Gegard Mousasi is. And so he's, he's really, he's really um, uh, not, n not many people have, you know, this, this hope that he's going to succeed in this. And the fight, the, the fight sort of unfolds in a, you've got round one, you've got round one with Rafael winning, you've got round two, Rafael winning, then Gegard starts to get a little wind Round two, uh, round three, he gets it. Round four, he gets it. So, and I'm going to stop there and let you guys watch the rest. But it, it, it's there. There are two rounds each. There's one round left, which is the championship round. And to see what happens in this round is absolutely inspiring. It's it's it, it wasn't just a fight. It was it, it, you couldn't script something like this. Really, it was unbelievable. I'll never forget the look on the face. The faces of the crowd of people that were there because all of his fans were there. We're in Europe anyway. This is his home. This is his home. We're not in America. Mm -hmm. We're in London. He has tremendous amounts of fans. I can see them. They're screaming for me because I'm, I'm right there. You know. And the looks on their face, <laughs> they were just in shock. They were literally in shock as you were bringing this thing home. It was unbelievable. It was one of the most inspiring moments of my life. But guys, you need to make sure you um, find that fight on YouTube. Uh, Rafael Lovato Jr. versus Gegard Mousasi, Bellator, a middleweight uh, title. And uh, I want you to know that this dog, this little gal right here, this is his gal. Okay, so when you're, when you're looking at me and you're thinking, where did he get... It's, it's my baby's baby, but then she became my but baby But she's too. your baby now. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. And when you're looking, you're probably, you guys are thinking... What's going on here? Where did you she get this? She wants to jump over here. She's looking. You want to go to Papa? Come on. I'll let you go to Papa. So when you guys are thinking to yourself, gosh, these, these big men with these little <laughs> sweet dogs, this is what, this is him really right here. There's the real. There's By the, the real, fireplace. Yeah, there's the real Look Raphael. Exactly. <laughs> there's the real experience. Yeah. Um, but this, is, this has been excellent. Um, can, can I say one more thing? Yeah, please. Um, sure. So, like I uh, touched on, in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. Well, a real special thing happened right before um, I was getting ready to walk out to the cage for this fight. Um, and you, you asked me to kind of bring it up a little bit. Um, and, you know, we talked about so many other things. But Think and Grow Rich is, um, uh, like, the most important book to me is very, I had a very, I have a deep relationship with the book Think and Grow Rich. Um, I came across it like uh, in 2007, 2008, mm. right after I won the Worlds. Um, and it just really was powerful for me. It, I had a moment with this book and it's, it's uh, been with me all the way through to, to today. And the author? And, Napoleon Hill. Okay, so Napoleon um, Hill, Think and Grow Rich. Okay. And I take that book with me to all my fights. So every fight I had, I, I brought the book, and I just open it up, and I read little bits and pieces of it just to put myself in the great mind space. And so I, I, I take it backstage, and uh, and I hadn't opened it up up to this point. You know, we, we were still going through a lot of stuff in London. Um, you know, I, I got injured in the middle of that, yeah, right in the middle of that time, <laughs> yeah. from the six week to the two week yeah. mark, I also got hurt because my mind was a mess. But, you know, up until the very end, uh, there was a lot of difficulty um, before going into that cage. And so we're backstage and I'm there and I am, you know, we're, we're just hanging out, uh, kind of the calm before the storm. And so I reached for my book and I said, all right, I'm gonna just read a little bit of it. And I already had my flap in a point of the book, right? So I open the book where my flap is, and I have different underlined and highlighted parts inside the book. 
and the very first thing that I see is this underlined part that says, every adversity carries with it the seed of an equivalent advantage. Mm. And that was so heavy for me. Mm. As soon as I saw that, and I just like looked up and it hit me. And I remember smiling. I looked around and saw my dad, I saw my DCO, and I smiled and I was like, we are gonna do this. Everything that I went through to get to that more, to get, to get to that point, you know, and just be able to fight, um, was my advantage. Can that you, was you, my advantage. Can you repeat that quote? Because it's, and I also love the way that, I love the wording. Mm -hmm. I think it's a brilliant phrasing as well. Every adversity carries with it the seed. That's I think important. It's mm -hmm. just the seed. It's mm -hmm. what you do with it, but. Uh, carries the seed of an equivalent advantage. So just as much as mm -hmm. you can get kind of hit and put down, that can make you grow. That's the seed that plants the, the strength. Yeah, what a beautiful phrasing. And, and it, this book, I think it's, it's deceptive when in its title, Think and Grow Rich, because mm -hmm. it's not about uh, necessarily monetization. It's about growing rich in your mm -hmm. life and becoming a more, uh, a richer person mm -hmm. in your happiness and your your per personal wealth yes. beyond and I, but I think that's a lot of times a lot of the stuff we talked about today you know yeah, they talk about in the book the kind of the recipe you know the mm -hmm. formula um, but it's not a necessarily a recipe for uh, financial richness that can be of course converted to that but its primary focus is is development of per of, of, of a person correct yes mm -hmm. and just achieving your goal you uh, you know if you want to Okay, you want to be rich, but how? What, what's your business? Mm -hmm. And then inside of that, um, you know, uh, learning and developing and, and creating and, uh, and becoming that success in that, in your craft, in your, in your business, whatever that may be, um, you know, this is the path that, and everything you're going to go through. And, and they, they uh, the author talks about, you know, he studied like, uh, hundreds of the most successful and wealthiest people of that era and uh, and he discovered like over 25 years I think it was he was around these people um, and he discovered the qualities the the traits the characteristics of these people that weren't that they all had in common mm -hmm. um, and uh, adversity and the, seems to be one of them. yeah you're always gonna go through adversity mm -hmm. um, and I'm just saying that to you know let people know like I said I, I lost time and time again everyone you're all all like guaranteed to go through those moments and look we all went through it as a whole world uh you know last year mm -hmm. and many people are still in the middle of it um look it brought you to montana look what you're doing now i lost i lost a business yeah to, to reimagine a mm -hmm. business you know exactly exactly and that's the the power behind it and um now i uh being the teacher and, and kind of all these experiences that I have, I feel like I have a lot to share and now I'm working on my own book. Um, and, uh, it's going to be very think and grow rich esque, um, with just sharing with through my own experiences, the, the lessons that I've learned and the, the lessons to apply, uh, mm -hmm. to life that I think could help, help everybody. I mean, it's, it's stuff that more or less you can hear in other books, you, you know, people, talk about it but I'm talking about it in my way and sharing my well, I think that's what all authors have to do is they have to share uh, their their wisdom through their personal narratives mm -hmm. and experiences and that's what makes every book interesting to read because it's it's a it's a personal biography it's mm -hmm. a personal it's a documentary about how you um, how you you know sort of applied these these I guess you would you would best phrase them as foundational principles mm -hmm. of of I say you know success because it sounds a bit trite but I, I think that uh, it, it really does it does sort of come down to ways that we have figured out how to achieve live. and live right and achieve and to, to again problem solve and stay positive how do you how do, <laughs> how, yeah, because you've been given a lot of problems and you've learned how to solve those problems in your way, mm -hmm. and your particular way 
is for, for those who are going to be studying your way, they're going to learn a lot about what can be said, you know, that, that is a shared way. You know, you're, you're learning from Napoleon Hill, you're learning from the masters that you've studied. Um, and we're, but I think the one thing about human experience is most of our shared strategies and tactics, um, the reason that they endure is because they do work. And as an example, knowing your why, I mean, how many, how many men from the beginning of time, men and women, humans, from the beginning of time have achieved something because they tuned in to why they're there in that moment. Mm -hmm. It's not, this is not some new age, mm -hmm. you know, th this is the way it's been done since the dawn of man. Mm -hmm. Why the fuck are you here right yeah. now? Yeah. And you better figure it out because you're about to, you're about to die yeah. for it. Mm -hmm. Or you're about to lose everything for it or gain everything for it, but you better know why you're here right now. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the kind of wisdom that we need to be focused on with mm -hmm. our children. And, with and that's what I share. Generation. That's what I want to share. That's yeah. my passion yeah. inside of teaching martial arts. That's what I like to, that's my real passion is just trying to inspire people. Yeah. And, uh, and I think this will be the most powerful way I can ever do that by writing a book. Well, you're so I'm, I'm hoping that it, yeah. to, it'll be released by the end of the year. Uh, I got some work to do. Going to try to get some work on that done this week. While I'm here, in well, my, you're an in inspirational zone, person. So. Thank you. Uh, uh, one of my one of my favorite humans in the world. And if we ever do a, a movie or a TV of the week, I think I should probably play you because <laughs> when I look at our similarities, I mean, yes, you're you know you're six three, six four. I'm I'm five five ten and a half. But I think there's so much similar. You got that half though. Yeah, but I got that half, which I think really <laughs> on camera makes for the really makes up the difference. And then coupled with us both now having a beard and, and longer hair. And we being so handsome. We almost look yeah, identical. Uh, <laughs> matter of fact, uh, um, you know, uh, your, your fiance, she came up and tapped me on the shoulder and she's like, hey, baby. And I was like, whoa, whoa, D, <laughs> D. Pretty, pretty, I, I, it's pretty easy to mistake us now. But, uh, you know, easy, easy. The big guy's right around the, the corner. Um, so, I, yes, yeah, so I just want to say that now that I, I want to put myself on the on the list for possible you know lead actors to play Rafael Lovato Jr. and that's it. So uh, guys, you have to get hit a lot though, Cam. Yeah, and you know, I'm so <laughs> handsome. I just don't want to get hit so much because I mean, look at what it, look look at what's at stake. Um, but yeah, no man, it's it's been and you have hit me a number of times in the face. I'll never forget one time we were sparring and you punched me with a cross and and I was like. I was like this, and Mauricio goes, okay, okay. He was like, okay, um, switch out, switch out. Mauricio literally saved my life because we were in the middle of a round. It was like, it was, there was probably a good two minutes left. You, you called me with a cross, and I was like, I was kind of like, I'm like, I'm good, I'm good. And Mauricio's like, okay, switch it out. No, no, He's yeah. always so positive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, he, was, he literally saved my life. He was like, okay, I'm coming in, switch. I will never, I know he's, I'm making him sound Italian. He's not Italian. He's Brazilian. Oh, man. I, let me give one more funny, funny Mauricio moment just to, to end things on, on a funny note. This is our striking coach, uh, by the way. Yeah. Uh, so I had a one fight, speaking of adversity and blah, 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 all this other stuff. Um, there was one fight where I broke my nose on Thanksgiving. The fight was December 2nd. Yeah, it was my was, last yeah. sparring day. And it was Thanksgiving Day at the same time, and uh, and and I just randomly—it was a fluke, like perfect. I, an elbow yeah. grazed the bridge of my nose. It's our boy Chris, and, uh, yeah. and broke my nose. Yeah. And we're a week away from the fight, you know. And uh, <laughs> I, I felt it happen. I immediately knew something was very wrong. I go over to the mirror. Well, first there was a little cut too, because it was an elbow. So it was a cut. And I'm just like, oh, and I hear this this snap inside my nose, and da da da, <laughs> and, and I'm and I'm like, I'm, I never broke my nose before, and I'm like super worried. Um, and this was a, a tough fight, another fight where I was going to be the underdog, um, and uh, and I, I I'm like looking in the mirror, and I'm trying to, I, I can't really see it all. It was all so fast, and I looked to Mauricio, and I'm like Mauricio, and Mauricio comes over, he looks at it, and he's like, I'm like. It's broken. It's going to be broken. And he's like, no, 
You're fine. You're fine. Everything's okay. You're good. You're good. No problem. No problem. Everything's fine. You're good. So positive, right? And I'm like, your nose is like, it, your nose is like no, 90 degree crooked. angled it's over you. Totally of course, crooked. of totally course crooked. it is. Of course it is. And, and I'm like, I don't know, Mauricio. I don't I know, bro. I really yeah. think it's broken. I really think, no, you're fine. No problems. Good, good, good. <laughs> and then the next day I see the doctor, right? I come out of the doctor's office. And of course the doctor says, yes, it's broken. 100%. <laughs> it's broken. Uh, I come out of the doctor's office my, and I said, Mauricio, I told you it was broken. It's like, yes, I know, I know. It was, it was broke. I know, I know. Uh, yeah, yeah. I know, but I mean, you know, believe, believe it's not broken. And that's Mauricio. Yeah, but that's how you gotta be. Most man. positive guy. That's Most, how you gotta I, be. I, I only, I only wish for everyone that I know to meet Mauricio because he's, <laughs> he's one of the. We'll eventually Most have him here guys. apart for one. Yes, of these, for one sure, yeah. for sure. We do a big camp and we bring all of our team together and yeah. everybody comes and trains with us. It'll be so special, but. uh I just want to I just want to express my gratitude for you to sit down with us today and share your story and your um, again strategies, tactics, ways of being an extraordinary human being. And I think it's inspiring. It's inspired me. It's 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 been I've used I've used you and your your story as inspiration for me. Uh, I've drawn upon it more than one time. It's made a difference in my life. So I, I felt it was really special to get to share that with um, uh, our, our Budokan family that tunes in every Sunday for us. So guys, thank you for um, staying with us and, and you know listening and holding space for such a special human being to share his story. And uh, guys, it's going to be a, a, an amazing 2021. I mean, That's right. I, I, yeah, I mean, I mean, I gotta say, 2020. When I when I look back on it collectively, I think yeah, 2020 was for. If we look at it, we go, well, it seemed like it was a shit show. But you know, I know, I know for me personally, I, it, it was one of the best years of my life. I know that's so ironic, because it wasn't one of the best general years in the world. But personally, uh, it brought me here. Yeah. It brought me many, many beautiful mm -hmm. opportunities. So that's the gratitude. Gratitude, gratitude. You know, so 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 I don't have this man. To you know, 2020. I can't wait to get through it. It's more like you know, I can't wait. I, I, I love the idea of, of things. You know, shifting away from some of the mm -hmm. some of the, the the conflict and some of the uh, the the tension that's that's come yeah. up in the world. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. beyond that. Uh, I think uh, I think I'm just going to keep being grateful. That's right. That's you know? the ticket, man. You have to, no matter what you've been through, or where you, you know, whatever. Like, if you're happy with who you are today, you can look back and say, "Well, all of that made me who I am today." That's and it. and the seed of adversity. And here we are. Here we are. You know. Yeah. <clears throat> so I, I just want to say thank you as well uh, for the opportunity, everyone, for joining and. Uh, um, listening to me i probably said you know a million times that's you my know. that's my thing it's your th sure, so yeah. sorry about that but uh thank you for this opportunity cameron it's great to be yeah. here really proud of you um excited for this week and uh yeah we start our, we start a fun retreat hopefully it'll be our annual retreat with Rafael, uh, snowboarding, skiing, and jujitsu with the world champion. And yoga and, and, and mobility. And yoga, mobility, all that. And lots of laughs. Yeah, absolutely. And we started last night with some laughs with some uh, Japanese whiskey. Mm -hmm. And then we had a lot of, had a lot, <laughs> a lot of laughs. W I woke up this morning feeling those laughs. Um, and I want to end one more time with that quote from Napoleon Hill. Let's just let's close it out. Finish it up with that. Every adversity carries with it the seed of an equivalent advantage. And let me add one more. Let me add one more. Victory is always possible for the person who refuses to stop fighting. If you yes. never quit, if you never give up, you're going to win eventually. Yes. Thanks, brother. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, guys. Thanks for joining us.